Chapter 24 of 2,000 Miles Below by Charles Willard Diffin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Bargain Rawson had taken one flamethrower with him. He tied it securely inside the shell so it could not shift with the changing gravity or be accidentally turned on. Again he clung to the curved bar against the wall. Loa stood at the center, directing the craft. Once again he floated in air, then found himself standing on what had been the ceiling of the room. The girl had released a considerable quantity of the lifting element in the jana's end, and now the black powder in the other end of the central tube was dragging them at terrific speed as it rushed away from the Earth's center. Over six hundred miles, Rawson had figured from that inner surface to the neutral zone, where the red substance of the Earth, that was neither rock nor metal, under terrific pressure, glowed with fervent heat or formed pools like the lake of fire. Perhaps a hundred miles thick, that zone of incessant energy, and their little craft tore through it at tremendous speed. Even so, he was gasping for breath in the heated room when the glow faded, and again he swung over and down upon the floor as Loa checked the speed of the flying projectile, and the little ship crept slowly up into the room where first he had seen it. The first that he noticed was the absence of the roar. The Java drifted slowly to one side, and Loa let it come to rest upon the floor. Staring from the open door, Rawson saw the familiar red walls and floor and the black opening of the shaft from which they had come. But the reverberating roar of the great organ pipe was gone. He knew that the air, for the greater part, was driving on past through the upper shaft that was now open. The way was clear for them to ascend. He turned to the girl. "'If my figures are right, it's some thirteen hundred miles from here on. How did you get up there before?' Loa pointed to the passage where the jana, on the other excursion, had been hidden. "'We went through there,' she said, taking the jana with us. We went up many miles through a great crack, but it was not straight. We had to go carefully to another passage opened through to the shaft far above where it was sealed. "'And the mole men never found it?' "'Oh, yes,' said Loa. "'They must have known of the crack, but they did not know where it led.' Its air was bad, a gas that choked. One could not breathe it and live. But in our little jauna we were safe. They could not use theirs, it was too large. Besides, only the priest came down. They had their lake of fire, where they did horrible things. They did not know that the shaft began again below. Okay, said Rawson, and closed the door. But I wish to get out, Loa protested, to gather more of the oro. We may need more, should we return. We will never need it, Rawson spoke softly. From the time we left Gore, we had just twenty-four hours to live. We must go on and go fast. They had no way of measuring time, and Rawson could only guess at the hours that passed while their little ship tore swiftly upward through the dark. He wondered if the occasional shrill shriek that followed the touching of their metal guides on the glassy walls could be heard up above. Then at last Loa was driving the jana slowly while she held her light so that it would shine through a window. Rawson had to restrain himself to keep from pacing the little room like a caged animal while the precious minutes slipped by. Now that the enemy was near, he wanted nothing but to drive up to the end of the shaft, come out into that world wherever the shaft ended, and try to fight his way through to the great hall where he hoped to find Fee-e-all, and his haste made him overestimate the passing time. Their journey had been swifter than he knew. "'I may have passed it,' Loa was saying doubtfully. "'I may have come too far.' Then she interrupted herself and sprang to the controls. They drifted slowly back. "'It is different now,' Loa said. "'The air rises more swiftly than before.' She stared from the window while she drove the jana slowly up and down, trying to bring it to equilibrium in the strong updraft. The air entered the shell through a little opening with the same pungent tang Rawson had noticed before. He had wondered about the air, 
Down near the neutral zone it was dense, yet he had not minded the pressure too greatly, and that had been puzzling. Rock pressure and air pressure, he had reasoned. They are two different things. If the rock flowed, any air that it trapped would be squeezed to a liquid. But it doesn't flow. The red stuff is solid, so the air pressure is only the weight of the air column itself. But even that should be enormous. He could only conclude that the lessened pressure came from that strange counter-gravitation, that repelling force from the center of the Earth. Perhaps it tended to dissipate the molecules, held them farther apart, prevented their squeezing in together and battering with a thousand little impacts on a point where one had hit before. Their jaunas swayed gently, as if the smooth air currents were disturbed and were drifting them sideways, and then at last, Loa, peering from a window, sprang back and moved the lever. Beneath them was the softly cushioned thud of the shell seating itself on firm rock. They were in another of the interminable caves, Rawson found when he opened the door. The jana was resting a few feet from the edge of the shaft. Cautiously they got out, but even without their weight it had a slight negative buoyancy. Oro is pulling more strongly than Gra, Dean said, and smiled. Already the names seemed familiar to him. The two lifted the jana and carried it back some twenty feet more, before Rawson realized how unnecessary this was. We'll never be using it again, he said. If I have guessed right, it will stay here as long as the rocks. If not, but we'll never know the difference anyway. He took the flamethrower from the car in sudden haste. Quick, dear, he told Lella. God knows when the end will come. Quick, show me the way. Loa knew every step of the route that took them on and upward through a maze of twisting passages, and Rawson marveled at her sense of direction. She flashed her light at times, the little bar of metal that had, in one hollow end, a substance which absorbed the light energy of the central sun. Rawson knew how it worked. Even the lights in the mountain room were taken out from time to time and exposed to the sunlight that brought them back into glowing life. He had seen similar phenomena on Earth. But, for the most part, Loa kept the little metal cap in place on the end of her torch, and they moved cautiously through the dark. Sounds of the Red Ones came to them at times, and once they hit in a narrow branching cleft that came abruptly to a dead end, while a force of Red Warriors marched hurriedly through the passage they had just left. Back in their hiding place, Rawson stood tense and ready, with his weapon till the last of the enemy was gone. Always he was frantic at the thought of the time that was slipping past, until at last the narrow passage that they followed cut transversely through another large runway that glowed faintly from some distant light. With that first gleam of light there came over Dean Rawson an odd change. Something within him had been cold with fear, fear of the flying minutes, fear that Loa might have lost her way in this tangled labyrinth of winding ways. And now, suddenly, he was carefree, filled with an absurd joy. Nothing mattered. They were to die. But what of that? Loa had chosen death. He would see that when it came to her, it would be quickly and without pain. As for himself, if before he died he could remove this ruler of an enemy race. So when Loa leaned close and whispered, The light, it shines from the council room of Fee All, Dean replied almost gaily, I've got to hand it to you. You sure do know all the back alleys. Then he stuck his head cautiously out into the dimly lighted corridor. It was broad. He saw where their own little passageway went on from the opposite side. But the light, the light. At his left, not a hundred steps away, was a room brilliantly lighted. And across it, in gleaming splendor, stretched a low wall, a barrier of gold. It was the council room, where once before he had faced Fee All in all that savage's hideous splendor. He listened. All was silent. Then Loa whispered, Fee All comes this way when he goes to the council room. But when he comes, or how often, I do not know. Dean pressed her back into the narrow way with his hands. Wait here, he said, 
and gave her the flamethrower. I've an idea. He stepped softly into the broad passage and, on naked, noiseless feet, moved swiftly toward the lighted room. It was empty. Beyond the barrier were no red figures, nor were there whistling voices to echo as he had heard them before. Here was the throne where Fee all had sat. Here the priests had stood. There, along the wall, were the chests. Fully twenty of them, each eight feet long. They stood ranged along the three walls of that part of the room protected by the barrier. No two of them alike. All of them were oddly carved and studded with jewels. The chests were ranged in a straight row, a foot or more out from the wall. He crossed to them swiftly. About here was where the priest must have gone. He raised one of the heavy lids till the light struck within. Bones, only fragments of a skeleton, blackened by age, a necklace of teeth from some animal's jaw, worthless trifles for the mummery of the priests. Then, beneath them, he saw two great fangs, a foot in length. They were curved, sharply pointed, and yellow as old ivory. What was it Gore had said of legends that told of ancestors coming from the outer world? Rawson knew that he was looking at priceless relics of the tribe, at the tusks of man's long-extinct enemy, the great saber-toothed tiger. But he had neither time nor thoughts to spare for the marvels new or old. He must find his gun. Yet, even then, he wondered what undreamed-of treasures the other chests might hold, what jewels, what paraphernalia of ancient kings. He must be silent. Perhaps the next great glittering container might hold the blue gleam of his gun. And this time, as the gem-studded lid was swung upward and back to rest noiselessly against the rock wall, Dean could not repress the audible gasp that came to his lips his own pistol. He had expected to find one weapon, but instead the chest was filled with all it would hold of rifles and sidearms and cartridge belts, all mingled in one indiscriminate heap. They were twisted, some of them, and bent, discolored too, evidently by flames. On some the stocks had been burned off. Rawson's hands were suddenly trembling. There was one rifle that seemed unharmed, he brought it out and hardly heard the little clatter that it made among the other weapons. An ammunition belt. He slipped out a clip of cartridges, made sure they fitted this gun, and threw one up into the firing chamber. He was fumbling for more of the clips when there pierced through his tumultuous thoughts the realization that he was hearing sounds not made by his own suddenly clumsy hands. Marching feet, whistling voices, they came from beyond the room's farther end, beyond the entrance through which he had once been brought a captive. He took one step back towards the broad tunnel, then knew there were others coming there. There was no possible avenue of escape. He threw himself in one wild dive into the narrow space between the chests and the wall, and pulled himself forward under the shelter of the one back-turned lid. The rifle was still gripped in his hands. By the sounds that came to him, he knew that the outer room had filled with red warriors, and that another smaller group had come scuffing from the passage where he had just entered. And by the echoing cry of shrill voices that shouted, Fee ye all, fee ye all, he knew that the ruler was near. Then there were footsteps approaching the chest, a priest, no doubt. Shrill whistling told of his anger. The concealing cover was jerked outward and down, and Rawson, staring above him, saw not the coppery face that he had expected, but the hideous white visage of Fee all himself. For an instant the ruler of the Mole Men stood half-stooped in petrified astonishment, and in that moment Rawson dragged himself to his feet. No chance to use the gun. The other was upon him, his gripping talons tearing Rawson's bare flesh. In one flashing thought, Dean cursed himself for the uselessness of his weapons. He should have taken a pistol, an automatic. Then, body to body with a savage, he was dragged out over the chest. He had been holding the rifle above him as he struggled from his cramped quarters. The savage had grabbed him about the shoulders, but his hands were still free. They held the gun on high, and in the second, when he found his feet under him, as Fee'eol dragged him clear of the chest, 
Rawson brought the breech of the gun crashing down upon the pointed skull. He felt the talons release their hold. The priests were rushing upon him. Fee all too, had been only momentarily stunned. He was springing. Then Rawson whipped the rifle down in line, and the clamoring shrieks that filled the room with tumult were drowned under another roar. He saw Fee all fall. Even then, through all the pandemonium within his own mind, he thrilled with satisfaction at sight of a little dot and a spreading stain above Fee all's heart, where only bare skin had been before. The next shot took the foremost of the priests. The others paused, hesitant for a moment, ranged out in an irregular line. Past them, beyond the golden barrier, Rawson caught a confused glimpse of a sea of red faces. Green flames were stabbing upward from their ready weapons. The priests were between him and them, and there came to Rawson in that instant, through all the chaos of fighting and half-formed plans, the knowledge that these priests were a living barrier that held off the flames. He fired once more to check them, then sprang for the wide entrance of the tunnel. He fired again back of him, shooting wildly as he ran. Then saw Loa as she came from her hiding place with a flamethrower ready in her hand. Quick, he gasped, get back. Then with her he was running, stumbling through the dark. There could be no escape. Even while they fled, he knew it. And yet they almost made it though the end, when it came, was one that neither could possibly have foreseen. They were following a wide passage, one of the countless thoroughfares of the Reds. It was deserted. Loa flashed her light freely. Ahead of them the passage turned. Just short of that bend was a rift in the rocks. There, Loa gasped, turn there. It will take us back to the jana. But the words were followed by a flash of green from dead ahead. The flames that made it came quickly after, and a dozen of the red warriors were before them, the light of their weapons slanting just above Rawson's head. His rifle was half raised. They would at least fight to the last. Then he realized that the green death was not swinging downward. From behind them, in the corridor through which they had raced, came a chorus of whistling shouts. Rawson whirled to find more of the red fighters, and again, though their hissing green flames were held ready, they did not descend. A priest, copper-colored, shining resplendently in the weird glow, detached himself from the group and stepped forward under the protection of their weapons. Loa's hand was depressing the muzzle of Rawson's rifle. Wait, she said. He wishes to speak. The priest stopped and addressed them. Loa answered, and to Rawson it seemed horrible that her lips and throat should be called upon to form those whistling words. Then she turned toward him. He says they will not harm you now if you surrender. Later, when they select a new ruler, he may order you set free. Rawson was doing some quick thinking. The priest was lying, clumsily, childishly, but it might be he could bargain with them. Tell them this, he ordered Loa. They are to let you go free, let you go right now. If they do that, I'll lay down my gun. If they don't, that priest will die before they get me. I don't think you can make it, he added, but go back to the jana. Don't stop for anything. Drive it as fast as you can. You may still get there before Gore does his stuff. And take the flamethrower in case you are followed. He stopped. Loa was laughing. Did you really think, Dean San, that I would desert you? Again she laughed softly, laughing squarely in the face of that waiting death. A laugh that was half a sob that caught suddenly in her throat as she stared at Dean. He could not read the look in her eyes as their expression changed. Yes, she said slowly, yes, you are right. If I say we both die, quickly. Again her voice made whistling sounds. The priest replied. Then Loa threw her arms around Dean and kissed him. He was gripping his rifle. Before he could take her in his arms, she was gone. She walked swiftly, the flamethrower in her hand, toward the dark cleft in the rocks, through which she disappeared. And Dean, though she had done what he really wished, felt that all of his life and strength had gone with him, with that fleeing figure. He placed his rifle on the floor, and straightening, held out his empty hands. The priest's talons were upon his flesh. 
But I got Fee E all anyhow, he was thinking dully. End of chapter 24